Over the years, I have done a number of different videos on clone video game systems. It's one of the things that just, it interests me from a technological standpoint. Going through one of our recent reviews that we did on the Classic 3 HD, which plays NES, Super NES, and Genesis, and I'll have that link for you right up there. Going through some of the comments, I saw some things that kind of made me think. When I say clone video game system, a certain picture pops in my head. But for other people, well, they may not have the same ideas that I do. So I figured, let's talk about what a clone video game system is. Hey everyone, Gary here with Rocksaw Productions. Thanks for stopping by and checking out what we have going on here today. I hope it is something that'll kind of help unmuddy some of the waters because when it comes to clone video game systems, there are a lot of assumptions out there that are incorrect, that are false information, and just there are more things out there than probably most people know. But what I want to know from you here today, do you have any clone systems? If so, what are they? And if not, which one would you want? I clearly have more than a few here. So in a nutshell, what a clone video game system is, is something that either from a hardware or a software standpoint replicates the performance of another type of system. So the NES is probably the most commonly cloned system out there. There's also the Super Nintendo, the Sega Genesis, and more. Now, some systems are harder to do a clone system than other, and that's why you tend to see NES, Super NES, and Genesis as the three primary systems that are out there. But how you get from point A to point B, that is a different path that different manufacturers can take. So I'm gonna walk you through my personal journey through getting clone systems and getting back into retro gaming. Let's get started. What I am holding in my hands is what got me back into retro video gaming. This is my original Retron 5 that I got back in 2015. And there's a number of things that this system did that I absolutely love. The fact that it could play import games from Japan that are a hell of a lot cheaper than what we got here in the US. There's simply more. And on a lot of the platformers and fighting games, you don't need any Japanese. Donkey Kong Country, perfect example. It is much cheaper to import the Japanese version than it is to buy the US version, and the game is identical. Super Metroid on the Super Famicom and Super Nintendo, you can select on both of them, Japanese or English. Super cool. Well, this could do both out of the box. It could also do uh, Famicom cartridges, the Japanese NES, NES, Super NES, Super Famicom, and Genesis as well. And on the front, it could do Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, and Game Boy Color games. Now, the thing with the Retron 5 and some other systems around the time that this came out is the fact that this is what is known as software emulation. It essentially runs a version of Android and it downloads the game from your cartridge and loads it into local memory. Now, a lot of people think that because it does multiple systems, all systems that have more than one system in it has to use software emulation. It's just not the case. And by and large, Hyperkin is about the only one really doing software emulation at any point at this time. Pretty much any other budget manufacturers, and I would say those would be systems that you could buy $150 or less. Most of those are hardware based. We're gonna talk about those in a second. But the software on here basically runs a version of Android that will allow you to play the games and apply filters and cheat codes and language patches, a whole lot of different things via an SD card slot here on the back. Now, in addition to the Retron 5, Hyperkin has also come out with like the Retron 77, which plays Atari 2600 games. Also uses software to go ahead and emulate the system. And finally, there's also the Retron SQ, which does Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, and Game Boy Color games, and again, uses an Android type of operating system or a Linux type operating system to go ahead, dump the games into local memory. But above and beyond that, just about everything else that we're gonna talk about here, it's based on hardware, not software. Memories, man. This guy here, the 8-bit HD video game system from Gamers Tech, was really my first entry into HDMI equipped clone systems that were hardware based. Like I mentioned, I had the Retron 5, also HDMI equipped. And that is one important thing to talk about here real quick. Everything I'm talking about has HDMI in addition to 
composite video output, uh, except for I don't think the Retron 7, no, this is just HDMI, and the Retron 5 is just HDMI. But these systems here and this guy here, they can do HDMI, or they can also do composite. Now, a lot of these systems had an older version that was composite only out of the box. That's your yellow, your red, and your white. Why is that important? Well, those systems basically pretty accurately rec uh, recreated at least the audio side of a Nintendo Entertainment System or a Super Nintendo or a Sega Genesis. The implementation of HDMI has caused some issues. Color palettes do not match what the original systems did. The audio is considerably off in most of the systems that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, there can be lag and latency and delay incorporated into systems like this. Now, this and all of these here uh, feature what is called a system on a chip or an SOC. What does that mean? Well, inside of an NES or a Super NES or a Genesis, you have your CPU, your, your main brain core functionality of the system. In the NES, you have what's called the PPU, which also helps with uh, you know, the graphics and things along those lines. A system on a chip basically recreates all of that and any onboard storage or RAM uh, and basically puts it all in one little, sometimes it's called a glob top. SOC is the most common thing. So with that, it is pretty much replicating or attempting to replicate the compatibility with the original systems through something less expensive and considerably smaller. Now, an SOC in theory is wonderful. In application, yeah, it hits and misses. Again, color palette issues, sound issues can arise. The biggest issue that you can run into is games compatibility. Level two in Battletoads is a common game that systems on a chip, at least the US version, can't handle. You can also get graphical glitches and issues in things like Castlevania 3 on the Super NES. Contra 3 also has issues with level two at the top down sort of display. Now, why do manufacturers use these? They're inexpensive and they're pretty much proven and they really haven't changed a whole lot in close to 20 years, even going back to the cheap systems that just did composite. It's essentially the same type of unit that goes into all of these. Now, some of them have been updated for better games compatibility. For example, the Retron 3 HD, which is the version of this one here that includes uh, the Sega Genesis compatibility, also works with virtual racing. It's really, really cool. Um, other systems such as the Super Retro Trio 3 Plus, the Classic 3, well, those don't work with that game. So that is an important point of differentiation. But systems on a chip, by and large, from a hardware standpoint, is how most of the budget sort of clone systems work. The final type of clone system we're gonna talk about here is one that I've actually never owned myself. I've tried at different conventions and they work wonderfully. I just haven't pulled the trigger on purchasing one. And that is something that features what is called an FPGA or Field Programmable Gate Array. Essentially what that is, is think of a system on a chip, but it can be anything. So Field Programmable, you can basically program an FPGA to replicate just about any hardware that's out there. Now you have to have the brain power behind it to be able to code it to recognize and reproduce the hardware. For example, the Analog NT, beautiful piece of hardware, beautifully repli uh, replicates the functionality of the NES and the Famicom, or in the Super NT, the Super NES and Super Famicom, the Mega SG, same thing for the Sega Genesis. Basically what it's doing is it's taking the hardware that went into the PPU, the CPU, the graphics, you know, any of that stuff, and it is basically emulating it through this FPGA type of device. Now, great and great compatibility, beautiful color palette. You can go ahead and customize it in a lot of different ways. So why aren't all of these clone systems using FPGAs? Because they're expensive. For example, the Retro USB AVS was about $200. Now it is getting a price increase because everything's going up in price right now. But it's one of those things that FPGA systems are not inexpensive. But they are more accurate when it comes to gameplay and they tend to also have less lag than 
a system on a chip or a software emulation based sort of solution out there. Now, like I mentioned, the Retro USB AVS is a beautiful solution if all you're looking for is NES and Famicom. And one of the really cool things about that system, unlike anything that you see here, is that system is compatible with the Famicom Disk System. So you can play Famicom disk-based games through that on clone hardware. Now, on the analog side of things, again, beautiful hardware. The, uh, the analog NT was $500, it, it, pretty expensive. Now, the other clone systems that they have put out through analog uh, have not been quite that expensive. And they are continuing to create more. The problem is they're still not inexpensive. They're still, you know, several hundred dollars and availability is definitely something that is a challenge. The analog pocket is a perfect example. You know, not super expensive, but to this date, I still don't know that you can really readily go ahead and order one from their website. One that I'm personally really, really interested in is they have a TurboGrafx-16 system coming out that's gonna be compatible with TG-16 Q cards, PC Engine Q cards, along with the CDs as well. And that is something, 200, 250 bucks, okay. I, I have a PC Engine and a TurboGrafx-16. I don't have the CD attachment, so for me, I'm really interested in that and it has HDMI out. So that's actually something really, really awesome. Now, there are a ton of different clone consoles out there and each one does something a little bit differently. You know, For example, like I mentioned, the Retron 3 HD that can handle uh, virtual racing. Not many Sega clones can do that. Um, the, you know, the classic 3 HD comes with two original controllers. The Retron 2 HD only comes with two system compatibility. The Super Retro Trio 3 Plus comes with, you know, nice long 10 foot long controller cables, but doesn't do 4x3, it only does 16x9. Gamers Tech, the 8-bit uh, HD, like I mentioned, my first clone system that I really tested, I haven't heard from these folks in almost three years. I don't know that they're still in business. But as far as the clone systems, theirs were some of my favorite that were out there. Like I mentioned at the top of this episode, I wanna know if you have a clone system, what it is, what your favorites are, or do you stick with original hardware? Now, I will say, yes, I have all of these clone systems. I play on original hardware now. And that is not me being a gaming elitist. Clone systems are where I got my start. Without the Retron 5, this channel doesn't exist. Point blank, the end. This is what got me back into retro gaming and got me into imports. It, it's just a simple case. This was where I started, but it's not where I ended. I am now happy that I have an NES, an NES top loader, a Sega Master System. I never owned one when I was a kid. I have, unlike Chris over at Game Dad, how you doing, boo? I have a JVC XI. He doesn't have one of them. Okay, Zoomer. Um, you know, I've got you know other systems that where before what I would do is I would trade in the previous generation on the new generation, the last time I did that, I traded my GameCube in on my Wii, and my PlayStation 2 in on my PS3. I don't do that anymore, but I had to go back and repurchase systems that I had been trading in to buy the next generation. And without clone systems, I would never have fallen in love with games like Earthworm Jim all over again, Super Mario World all over again. And I also wouldn't have experienced great games that I never played back in the past. Yoshi's Island, as much as I joke with Jay over at Square Pegs, make sure you check out his channel in addition to Game Dads. You know, I joke with him about the Yoshi games because he hates the title screen on Yoshi Story. And yes, I said scream, not scream. Um, Yoshi Story was something I had never played before. It's one of my favorite games on the platform now. I absolutely love it. There are so many titles, again, that I now have been able to not only play, I have in my collection here. And it's all thanks to clone hardware. It's all thanks to the Retron 5, at least initially. And from there, I dove deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. Now, if you do want to check out some of the videos that we've done on you know, reviews on the classic uh, HD, the classic 2 HD, the classic 3 HD, the Super Retro True 3 Plus, the Retron NHD, Retron 2 HD, Retron 3 HD, all the gamers tech systems and more those episodes are coming up for you right now thank you so much for watching this episode if you want to help support 
Rockstar Productions and be a part of our community, there's a number of different ways you can do so. First and foremost, join us over on our Patreon page or become a channel member here on YouTube. By joining through either one of those methods, you get early access to just about all of our video content, exclusive content, and a whole lot more. We also give you shout outs at the end of each and every one of our videos. You can also pick up some awesome Rock Solid Production swag. We've got t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, and more available through our Teespring store on screen right now too. You can also pick up some of our awesome 3D printed cartridge stands, Amiibo holders, Nintendo DS holders, and more by visiting our 3D printer store on screen right now as well. Links for everything will be down below in a pinned comment. If you want to stay up to date with everything we have going on here at Rock Solid Productions, make sure that you're following us on the different social media networks. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Productions, Instagram at instagram.com slash rocksolidproductionsgk, and Twitter at Rocksolid Studios. If you're looking to pick this and other retro and modern gaming accessories up, make sure that you head on over to castlemaniagames.com. He has a feature over there called Castle Cash, where the more you spend, the more you earn towards future purchases, and Castle Cash is just like cash. He also offers convenient payment plans for more expensive items over $50. Finally, make sure that you use promo code ROCKSOLID10 when you're shopping at CastlemaniaGames.com as it can save you up to 10% on most items on the website. Again, thank you for watching this episode and I cannot wait to see you again soon.